Let me encourage you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Esther in chapter 2 this morning. Hope you have a copy. If you don't, that text is inside the uh, bulletin. Been a busy week again in uh, our country, inauguration. Uh, if you, well, you missed first service, that's why you're here, but uh, you missed uh, our guest at first service, but that's all right. Zach's daughter, Nora, <laughs> greeted Bernie. Have you ever seen anything so stupid go so far so fast than this picture of Bernie Sanders? So if you're offended, I apologize. We'll, I'll make it up to you. I know. I'll preach a longer sermon. <laughs> okay. All right. So try as he might, Xerxes' party did not last forever. We, let, we read last week in chapter 1 that he held a 180-day banquet for his nobles and his officials, um, most likely to, you know, curry their favor, maybe make a few empty promises, some incentives for uh, a battle that he was planning that we'll hear about more later. That was followed immediately with a seven-day banquet in the city of Susa for all the men, uh, young, old, rich, poor, greatest to the least. Uh, they drank themselves silly, including Xerxes. You'll recall that at the height of his drunkenness, he commands his wife, Queen Vashti, to come out and parade herself in front of all these drunken men, which, you know, just like images of a, of a debauched bachelor party. Xerxes is basically presenting his wife like all the other possessions in his, in his palace. Vashti puts Xerxes in his place by refusing the command, but in the process, she becomes displaced. In, in an overreaction, one of Xerxes' cabinet members suggests an empire-wide edict or decree go out to all the provinces under the Persian Empire with three primary um, demands. One, that women everywhere respect their husbands. Number two, that men are rulers over their homes. And three, that the king find a queen who is better than Vashti, probably meaning someone more subservient um, and weaker. Xerxes agrees, the edict goes out, and sometime later, the king finds himself hungover, full of regret, and lonely. Solomon was surely right in Proverbs 20. Wine is indeed a mocker, and those led astray by it are not wise. This is the height of folly. It doesn't matter if you're the leader of the known world or not. This is foolishness to the nth degree. So... If you weren't here last week, if you still haven't read the book of Esther, which I encourage you, please, please, please to do. If you haven't, you're at least to this point caught up. Now, one of the things we also learned last week in chapter 1, verse 3, is that those, all these events we just described happened in the third year of Xerxes' reign. We know from our text today in chapter 2, verse 16, that what we're going to look at today happened in the seventh year of his reign. So if I'm any judge of numbers, and I'm not, this is about a four-year gap between chapter 1 and chapter 2. History helps us fill in that gap. And in this time, this four years time between chapter 1 and 2, Xerxes did, in fact, take his armies, invaded Greece, specifically Athens, but like his father before him, Darius, who was defeated, Xerxes also is unsuccessful in his campaign against Greece, it's been a bad stretch for Xerxes. In the annals of history, the Greek historian Herodotus, again, we mentioned him last week, a, a Greek historian who lived just a couple of decades after Xerxes, he described Xerxes' life after this defeat, after the decree concerning Vashti, as one of, of sensual indulgence. In fact, it was his undisciplined immorality that would eventually lead to his death. He was known to carry on with the wives of his nobles and officials, one of whom decided to assassinate Xerxes in his own bedroom in 465 B.C. 
which reminds us of another proverb. Chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. Surely her, and that, that pronoun is, is, an, is, is a way of describing promiscuity, a, a, adultery, a fornication, sensuality. Surely her house leads down to death and her paths to the spirits of the dead. None who go to her return or attain the paths of life. It's more than just folly. I mean, this, is, this is life and death. And it eventually leads to Xerxes' death. He's poor, filthy rich, but poor in character. Perhaps his attendants see his promiscuity and the potential danger. They suggest another outlet for his sexual appetite, which we will read in chapter 2. Let's read the first four verses, um, Esther chapter 2. Later, when King Xerxes' fury had subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what he had decreed about her. Then the king's personal attendants proposed, let a search be made for beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king appoint commissioners in every province of his realm to bring all these beautiful young women into the harem at the citadel of Susa. Let them be placed under the care of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women, and let beauty treatments be given to them. Then the, let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. Well, because we already know Xerxes to be a fool, this advice appealed to the king, and he followed it. Did you notice how the, the, the mention of young women three times? Let, let's bring someone in here who won't have a mind of her own. Let's bring someone in here who won't resist. It, it's, it's misogynistic. Xerxes looks down on women. It's lecherous. He uses women. He does not respect them. And as hard as all this is to grasp and to listen to and to read, I would suggest to you that it's all under the providence of God. Now, that's the more difficult part of this. We're going to read later in this chapter some startling accounts of this process as it's played out. And whatever your, um, your images were before, I, this, is, this is not a beauty pageant. This is not some women walking a runway with a sash. It's worse. It's much worse. And yet I'm proposing this is part of the providence of God. That Proverbs 21.1 is just as true here as it is any other time. That the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. How is that possible now? How is this possible? Well, let's wrestle with it before we get further into the story. So having read the story of Esther, which I'm sure you have, maybe even more than once, at least I hope so, you kept seeing these fantastic coincidences and lucky turns, didn't you? And here I am proposing to you that these moments or those moments, for instance, chapter 6, verse 1, the king can't sleep one night. He decides to help him in this, in this insomnia stage that have the, the, the records of, of history read back to him. That's, we read that and we say, well, of course that's the providence of God because it's going to lead to better things for God's people. So we don't have any problem recognizing moments like that as God's providence, not coincidence, not random fortune. But so too is the, the suggestion of building this, his harem, of having the women go into the king to please him and the selection of Esther being the winner. All God's providence which, which is to say that his providence is just, it's not as neat and tidy as we might like it to be. The people involved in God's providence aren't as neat and tidy as we'd like them to be. Our lives, our actions are not as neat and tidy as we would like them to be. See, God doesn't use just the best moments of our life, just the obedient moments of our life. Yet in his providence, he has worked through all of it to bring us to this day. So because this 
this providence of God is so central to the story of Esther and a central truth of who God is, I want us to come back to it again and, and try to increase our understanding of it. This week, I, I saw an advertisement on, on Facebook. I was scrolling down, and there's John Piper, a video. I don't know if any of the rest of you saw it um, from the Desiring God Facebook page. So if I mess, I, I guess I'm saying if I mess all this up, you, um, you're in good hands because Piper's next book comes out in March. We'll be done with Esther by then. And he's written a 750-page book on simply titled Providence. So whatever I mess up, you'll want to go out and buy a 750-page book and read it on the providence of God, right? I mean, Bob, no. Beth says no. Bob says yes. So they can hash that out. Like the king in chapter 6, if you have trouble sleeping some night, you might want to buy this book and have, have a good read through it. All right. Let me give you another definition of providence. I gave you one at the very first week of this, the introductory sermon um, a couple weeks ago. If you're keeping your notes, let's just, I just want to add to this. Let's just keep laying, putting some layers on this so that we come to a better understanding of what this central truth is in the story of Esther. This, this definition comes from Louis Burkhoff, uh, a 20th century theologian, wrote a book on systematic theology still used in seminaries today. Here's his definition. Providence may be defined as that continued exercise of the divine energy whereby the creator preserves all his creatures, is operative in all that comes to pass in the world, and directs all things to their appointed end. Now, I think it's that last phrase that is so critical. That God is doing all this, op preserving, operating, directing all things to their appointed end. So let me offer three words to maybe kind of build on this and help us. The first word being clarity. I, I use the word clarity because I think scripture is clear that God rules and God reigns over the affairs of humanity. Some who have a hard time with this, we call deists. I don't know if you've ever heard that phrase before, that word before. It's a philosophy that says, well, we believe that God created the world, um, and we believe that God exists. We just believe that he's not involved in our lives. It's that old analogy of making a watch, winding it up, and just leaving it alone. The, the, the deists believe that God has separated himself from the world he created with no interference. Now, you can, you can partly understand where those people are coming from because there are difficult, there are hard things to explain in this world. Things like tragedies, like evil, like, a, like the wickedness of King Xerxes. And so the explanation, well, then God's just, God's just not involved. But there's, there's too much unexplained by, by taking that route. Let me give you an example of God's clear providence. And we're going to, again, we're going to keep building on this. Remember last year in our study of Abraham, in chapter 18, he's promised that this time next year, he's going to be a father. That's, that's, that's succeeded by the story of God destroying Sodom and Gomorrah, but Lot and his family being saved. But then we find in chapter 20 that Abraham has been moving along. For, we don't know why he moves, but he, he, he moves along to an area called Gerar, and there's a king of that area called Abimelech. And when Abraham enters this region, he tells those who matter that Sarah, his wife, is his sister. He's done this before. Remember chapter 12, he did that in Egypt. This time we find out that, that Sarah joined in the conspiracy. She said Abraham was her brother. And so in a male-dominated society such as it was, Abimelech takes Sarah, he has rescued by God. God comes to Abimelech in a dream and says, in so many words, do not touch that woman. Abimelech kind of responds, I, I didn't know. I'm, I'm innocent. You know, she, she, was, she's, she was conveyed to me as the man's sister. We read this in Genesis 20, verse 6. Then God said to him in the dream, yes, yes. 
I know that you have done this in the integrity of your heart, and it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. God's clear operation and direction for an appointed end. What's the appointed end? When Sarah becomes pregnant, there can be no doubt who the father is. Because that's the promise that goes back 25 years prior in Genesis 12. All right. Well, let's add, I don't mean to confuse matters, but let's add another word to this. And that's the word mystery. This is where I land on some of the difficulties with the clarity that God directs all things without violating the nature of things. He directs all things without violating the nature of things. So God uses Xerxes' free decision to banish Vashti because it's, a, it's according to Xerxes' nature. He's a fool. God allows him to be the fool. Xerxes makes a bad decision. God's going to use it. God can see what the rest of us can't, that in the course of events, a decision is going to be made to annihilate the Jews. But God is watching, and God is working things out to his appointed end. They will not be destroyed. Salvation must come from the Jews. I will preserve them. Just as he did in the life of Joseph. Sold into slavery by the evil plot of his brothers. But years pass. Long story short, Joseph's brothers come back to Egypt where Joseph now is and is a ranking official in the Egyptian government storing food where the rest of the world around them is experiencing great famine. And this confrontation with the brothers takes place and the providence of God is unfolded. Genesis 50 verse 20 Joseph says to his brothers, as for you, you meant evil against me. That was your heart. But God meant it for good. To bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Free decisions, often sinful decisions, but used to bring about God's appointed end. Which leaves us, I think, in a place of security. Third word, security. Because... Because God does not tempt us to sin. James 1, remember, is very clear about that. God does not tempt. He can't be tempted, nor does he tempt. Where does sin come from? Our own desires, James says. But that doesn't mean that sin can thwart God's appointed end, which is the security we live under in Romans 8, 28 that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So I hope that makes a little bit of sense. Well, I hope, I hope it makes a lot of sense, but if it doesn't, let's, we'll continue the conversation. But without this basic understanding of providence, we would read the book of Esther and we would conclude the Jews living under the Persian Empire are just lucky to be alive. And without this understanding, we might look at our own lives and conclude we're just, I think, my lucky stars that I'm alive. It's not luck that has brought us here. It's the providence of God who preserves, operates, and directs all things to their appointed end. Even when the path is messy and sin-stained. So speaking of that, enter into the story Esther and Mordecai. Chapter 2, we get our first introduction in verse 5. Now, there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin named Mordecai, son of Jair, the son of Shammai, the son of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, among those taken captive with Jehoiakim, king of Judah. Just very quickly, the Hebrew structure of that is not to tell us that Mordecai was taken into exile along with king Jehoiakim, but his ancestors were. Next verse. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This young woman, who was also known as Esther, had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. 
Now, it has to be a little classroomish here at, this, at the outset, just because we have to know what we're dealing with. So I apologize for the, uh, the kind of this, this <laughs> I don't know, I was going to say lecture style, but it's always lecture style. I don't ever ask for questions. So a um, couple important facts to keep in mind. Number one, Mordecai is a Benjamite. That's important. We're going to find out why that's so important next week. That means he's a descendant of Saul. 1 Samuel 9 tells us the family history is, all, is tied together. But Mordecai is a Persian name. We have no record of his Hebrew name. Not sure what that says, but we know him as a, by his Persian name. But next week, we're going to see the significance of his family heritage. Okay? Hadassah. Hadassah is better known by her Persian name, Esther. We know that she's orphaned. We know she's adopted by Mordecai. We don't know if Mordecai has a wife. We know that she has a lovely figure and she's beautiful. Now, the author is not attaching any virtue to her beauty. The world sees physical beauty as a door opener and even virtuous for some reason. Scriptures warn against that mentality. Most notably, again, in the Proverbs, chapter 31, the end of a chapter extolling the virtues of a godly woman where physical beauty is not connected to virtue. In fact, just the opposite. Proverbs 31, 30, charm is deceitful. Beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. So we'll see that Esther's beauty opened doors for her. But that doesn't mean that every open door should be walked through, right? So here are our main characters. In all the ambiguity and all the difficulty that it raises, here's Esther and Mordecai. Now, this is the PG-13 section of the sermon. Uh, there's no getting around it. Again, this is not a beauty pageant. It's as lurid and, and lascivious as it sounds. Verse 8. When the king's order and edict had been proclaimed, many young women were brought to the citadel of Susa and put under the care of Haggai. Esther also was taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Haggai, who had charge of the harem. She pleased him and won his favor... Immediately, he provided her with her beauty treatments and special food. He assigned to her seven female attendants selected from the king's palace and moved her and her attendants into the best place in the harem. We don't know how she curried his favor. We don't know what, what was her, her charm, her beauty. We don't know. We just know that she gained the leader's favor. Verse 10. Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. Don't tell anyone you're a Jew. Every day, he walked back and forth near the courtyard of the harem to find out how Esther was and what was happening to her. Most scholars assume that Mordecai had some kind of position within the palace. Much like years later, Nehemiah was the cupbearer of the king. Mordecai must have had some kind of job some kind of responsibility there. That's why he's, the, the courtyard is, is, is accessible to him. Verse 12, before a young woman's turn came to go into King Xerxes, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments prescribed for the women, six months with oil of myrrh, six with perfumes and cosmetics. And this is how she would go to the king. Anything she wanted was given her to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening, she would go there, and in the morning, return to another part of the harem to the care of Shaashgaz, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the concubines. She would not return to the king unless, she was pleased, unless he was pleased with her and summoned her by name. When the turn came for Esther, that is, the young woman Mordecai had adopted, the daughter of his uncle, Ab uh, uh, of his uncle Abigail, Abihail, to, when it was time for her to go to the king, she asked for nothing other than what Haggai, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the harem, suggested. And Esther won the favor of everyone who saw her. She was taken to King Xerxes in the royal residence in the tenth month, the month of Tibet, in the seventh year of his reign. Now the king was attracted to Esther more than to any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head, made her queen instead of Vashti. And the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, 
for all his nobles and officials. He proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces and distributed gifts with royal liberality. Your version may say that he kind of gave a tax break to everyone in the kingdom. If you see this in your mind's eye, you kind of try to play it out as, as a movie or something. You, you see these, these officials going throughout the 127 provinces of the Persian Empire, picking and choosing beautiful young virgins to be snatched from their families. I don't imagine it was a pretty process. Yes, there was the promise that one of them could be queen, but they knew that if they weren't going to be the one selected, their life was going to be lived out. The rest of their years were going to be lived out in the king's harem until, I guess, I suppose they were discarded. It's not a pretty picture. We don't know how much Mordecai pushed for Esther to be one of these women, if he did at all, if she was taken voluntarily or involuntarily. We do know that when she was taken, she pleased the man in charge, Haggai. We also know, that, again, as we mentioned, that Mordecai instructed her, don't tell anyone about your, your ancestry. Based on the actions of a man named Haman, who we'll see next week, maybe it's racial tension with the Jews, it's old family history, which is a part, perhaps, but it's a curious decision on Mordecai's part. So the selection process is described. As I mentioned, it's, it's lewd, it's immoral, as much as it sounds. But Esther complies, Esther wins, Esther is proclaimed as queen, they eat. In the words of one commentator, Mordecai and Esther may be heroes, but they are at best heroes of questionable morality and orthodoxy. They join a list of other folk from the Bible too, don't they? Samson, even David. Well, there's one more paragraph to be read in chapter 2, and it's important because it's a springboard to next week's lesson in chapter 3, beginning with verse 19. When the virgins were assembled a second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. But Esther had kept her family background and nationality just as Mordecai had told her to do, for she continued to follow Mordecai's instructions as she had done when he was bringing her up. She still hasn't told Xerxes or anyone else around that she's Jewish. During the time Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Big Thana, it just reeks of Big Tuna, but we'll call him Big Thana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway became angry and they conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. This is important. This is major stuff. But Mordecai found out about the plot, and he told Queen Esther, who in turn reported it to the king, and she gave credit to Mordecai. And when the report was investigated and found to be true, the two officials were impaled on poles. All this was recorded in the book of the annals of the, in the presence of the king. So again, maybe it's Esther's new position as queen. Maybe Mordecai always had a job in the king's court, but he, he's in a prime spot to hear this assassination plot reports to Esther. She reports to the king. It's true. The conspirators, conspirators are done away with. So those are the highlights of chapter two with a, just a little bit of context. The challenge, <laughs> what do we do with this? What, what are we supposed to learn from this? More importantly, what is God revealing about himself in this? How is his provident, providence, our security, in our turbulent times. Well, let me, let me offer a couple points of application that I hope makes sense. See, here's, in my mind, here's the difficulty we face in this setting. But I also believe it's, it's one of the difficulties we're facing currently. That difficulty is this. Sometimes the providence of God seems to run contrary to the promises of God. Sometimes the providence of God, the way life is turning out, seems to run contrary to his promises. So the question is, what do you do then? 
How do you respond? I think that's very much the case for the Jews living in Susa. Well, what are the promises that, that they have? Glad you asked. If you have your Bibles and you'd like to read along with me, it's, it's a bit of an extended passage, but I, I want to read from Jeremiah 29, beginning with verse 4. Because for the, before the first, or, or right after the first exiles were taken into Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar, the prophet Jeremiah wrote this message from God to the people, and he sends it by a courier, hand-delivered to the, to the first exiles, Esther and Mordecai's great-grandparents, if you will. And here's the message, Jeremiah 29, beginning in verse 4. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens. Eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so they too may have sons and daughters. He doesn't say intermarry, but he says, just carry on as you did if you were in Jerusalem. Increase in number there. Don't decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. There are false teachers, even among the first exiles taken into to, to Babylon. Don't listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. <laughs> I love that line. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them. What, what do you think the, people, the exiles are wanting the, the false teachers to, to dream and prophesy about? This won't last. This, this, will just, this is just a blip on the screen. We'll be back home. God's not that upset. Very next line. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you. And fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I'll be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. But as Esther and Mordecai are living in their day and age, it did not look like there was much prospering. Didn't look like a lot of hope. It's going to get worse too, right? Future? What do you mean our future we're going to be get annihilated. Abraham, you're going to be the father. <laughs> and you're going to be great. You're going, you're going to be the father of nations. All people will be blessed by you. In the present, no child. For 25 years. The providence seemed to contradict the promise. Just as it did for Joseph. Sold into slavery. Tossed into prison. Just as it did for Moses, who's promised God's power and presence in leading Israel out of Egypt. But he's met with resistance and increased labor. And finally, a, a, they reach a point where an ocean is in front of them and the Egyptian army's behind them. The present looked pretty bleak. Contradicts the promises. So what do you do in those moments? You trust God's promises while you accept his providence. I don't know any other way to say it. You trust God's promises while you accept and live in the providence. You don't doubt God's promises because his providence confuses you. And worse, you don't live outside of God's promises thinking you can undo his providence. His providence. 
It was that that convicted me when I heard these words from Alistair Begg. I'm not hiding behind his words. I agree completely. I fear for American Christianity, he said, that doesn't come to terms with an understanding of God's providence in the affairs of time. Because when we read our Bibles, it's clear that God often in history has made use of the wicked, sometimes to protect and shield his people, and at other times to purify and refine his people. Some of us are so proud that we're tempted to think we could order things better if we had the government of the world in our hands. He didn't say that last week. He said that in 2013. How do we do? We still think we could do a better job. Let me be... <laughs> the leader. I understand being impatient with God. What's unacceptable is when we're tempted to disbelieve God because he's given us too many reasons to trust him even when and especially when life is confusing and troublesome. One of the things we said at the very beginning of this series was that on, on, on a on an individual tree basis, the book of Esther is very messy, but you have to get above it the forest view to see the beauty. It's the forest level perspective where we see God is preserving a people in the midst of an alien environment so they might be witnesses to his name. He's preserving them even in a difficult situation so that they will witness to his name. He did not have them overthrow the Persian government to bring down the government or to just whine and complain. Their job was to learn what it meant for them to affirm their faith in an alien environment. And to this point, Esther and Mordecai are not doing so well. But the story's not finished. Second point. We need to accept the consequences of obedience under any circumstances. Accept the consequences of obedience under any circumstances. Rather than trying to always alter our circumstances so it's easier to obey. God's providence does not relieve us of personal responsibility. We are to walk by faith and not by sight. It does relieve us. God's providence does relieve us from trying to understand it all. God never asks us to understand it all. Joseph or Joshua, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you don't get it. Just take the people and march around Jericho once a day for seven days, seven times on the seventh day. It doesn't matter if you understand. <laughs> Do it. What we are to understand are God's promises. His character, his activity in the past that governs our faith in the present. And when we do that, I believe we will grow in our trust regardless of the circumstances, the providence that we're living in. In our trust, we obey. It sounds like the beginning of a good song. We obey in order to affirm what the life of faith looks like, regardless of the conditions and the environment. Leave that to the providence of God. So whether favorable or threatening, we're called to obey and accept the consequences. We don't see it so much here in chapter 2. We'll see it later in chapter 4. All right, let's close. Rather than me praying, a, uh, I'd like you to join in me. And let's, let's allow a song to be our prayer. I heard just a little bit of murmuring. So there's a few of you who know this song. If you do, I'd invite you to sing it with me so I'm not singing a solo. If you don't, read the words and allow it to be a prayer. Would you stand with me, please? And let's close with this song. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still. And with all who will trust and obey.
Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey.